together in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear Jesus, we love you so much, and we want to thank you that you are with us today. Lord, you are with us every moment. And when we could just recognize your love with us, Lord, we just stop and recognize you are Emmanuel, God with us, Lord. We are enveloped in your presence, and Lord, in whatever way we can, Lord, we want to take hold of the fullness of joy that you have for us when we are in your presence, Lord. Be our teacher today, not so much what I would say, but please, oh Lord, speak to the hearts of your people through the word of God. I pray in your holy and precious name, Jesus, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So we are, uh, this week's lesson, we are week one, and we are on our scripture day and day one. So um, this is, this is a, such a neat lesson today. Um, this in your presence is fullness of joy. Um, I thought it was really sweet, um, you know, how we put our name in the scripture. And so in your presence, Angie has fullness of joy, but one of the leaders said she put uh, in, in, in Angie's, she didn't use my name, she used her name. I'm just saying. <laughs> she said, in Angie's presence is fullness of joy. She went, oh! That, well, she realized that that was a capital. <laughs> and it was in the presence of Jesus and God. And we have fullness of joy. So we do have that fullness of joy. And, and it's such a gift to us. Um, because there, there's something that's wonderful about this. Um, I'd like to uh, read you my meditation. And so uh, this scripture reminds me uh, of Jesus, who is Emmanuel. He is God with us. Emmanuel means God with us. Not so much a God of the past, though he was, and not so much a God of the future, though he will be, but a God of the present, a God who is God with us in the present moment. A God who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Our God who is Emmanuel, the great I Am, and He is with us and He will never leave us because He is. Not a God who was or who will be, but a God who is and who is ever present in His omniscience, His omnipotence, and His omnipresence. So He is Almighty One. He is the Almighty, All-Knowing, Ever-Present God. And he is with us in ways that we just can't even imagine. And he will never leave us because it is his promise. And if we can recognize him in the present moment, we will be filled with joy. And his presence is fullness of joy. John 15, 11 says, he has given and he has told us this so that his own joy may be in us, that our joy may be complete. Our joy may be full. For some reason, every time I think of this, I think of this, this uh, water, uh, a bowl of water uh, just being poured into me. And, and it is so full of the Holy Spirit of God, that, that living water, that I am just overflowing. And there's a fullness there uh, that I hope that you can experience. Um, and, but the only way is by the power of the Holy Spirit that God's joy can be in us. So I thank you, Lord, for filling us with joy. In you, we have fullness of joy. Well, in my um, revelation, the first thing that came to me was day by day, day by day. Oh, dear Lord, these things I pray to see thee more clearly, love thee more dearly, Follow thee more nearly, day by day. So you know that, day by day, moment by moment, this is our joy. Jesus present with us. I apologize for not writing down the name of that person who wrote that poem, because it was so beautiful. But this is the reality of my presence, the Lord says, that I am with you. And this is how my joy enters in through your desire and hunger for me, says the Lord. This is the power I give you to know me. And when you hunger for me, I will fill you with my own spirit that brings a fullness of my joy. 
It is in this way that you become a fountain of living water, an outpouring of my Holy Spirit flowing through you. <coughs> this scripture came to mind also. For some reason I thought, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, they shall be satisfied. And the Lord said, this is how you are filled with joy, that you seek me and hunger for me with all your heart, and that you exult and rejoice in me as did my mother. The Magnificat then came to my mind. My soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord, and my spirit exalts in God, my Savior. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. So, I would say, in his presence is fullness of joy. In a little while, we will go deeper into understanding what God wants for each one of us. He wants us to live in the power of the Holy Spirit. And uh, in just a little bit, I will share with you what that means in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So this lesson, when we invite Jesus into our hearts and we ask him to fill us with his Holy Spirit, he will. It's his promise. He says, how much more will the Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? So part of that is our adult relationship with Jesus. Our ordinary life experiences have a way of becoming extraordinary. Our scripture this week is, in your presence is fullness of joy. And until we know Jesus and his presence in our lives, nothing satisfies. And we yearn for something. And we think, I could be happy if only. <coughs> what is the if only in your life right now? For a teenage girl, it might be, I would be happy if only I didn't have this pimple. <laughs> I could be happy if only, for a teenager girl, if a boy would ask me to the prom, or the winter formal, or whatever. Her face clears up, she giggles to the prom, but what's missing? Still, something's missing if she doesn't have Jesus. Pretty soon, it's something like, if only... She gets older. If only I was married, then I would be happy. If only I had that beautiful wedding where I could walk down the aisle and, and my gown was just trailing after me. If only, and then she does. And then it was only if I had children that I would really be happy. <coughs> and then it would be if only my husband would get a better job. So I wouldn't have to work. And then pretty soon it's, well, it, I could be happy if only... If only somebody would take care of these children of mine. <laughs> so, when it all comes down to it, until we invite Jesus into our hearts and ask him to fill us with his Holy Spirit, that is when we're going to be satisfied because that is when we are going to be strengthened by the power of God's Holy Spirit. And when we do, life has changed for us. We can't put our finger on what is so different. We can't even put our finger on anything except the fact that even when our experience of laying on of hands and the baptism of the Holy Spirit, some people say, oh, I prayed in tongues right away. And some people will say, nothing happened. I didn't feel a thing. And yet, all of a sudden, something has changed in our yeah. life. We don't know what it is. When we have Jesus and we live by the power of his Holy Spirit, we can realize that word in his presence is fullness of joy. So let's move, excuse me, move to the Annunciation of the Birth of John the Baptist. Mm -hmm. And I would like to read it from our, um, from our lesson. Here it is. <coughs> and it is um, week, on day one, if you want to look through your notes, on um, Luke 1, 5 through 25. I am just so much more comfortable being in from my life. Mm -hmm. So this says, and, and it's a it's a long discourse, so I would just like to invite you to, I, if you want to close your eyes, fine, but enter into this experience. This is a story, but it's a true story. In the days of King Herod of Judea, there lived a priest called Zechariah who belonged to the Abijah section of the priesthood. And he had a wife, Elizabeth by name, who was a descendant of Aaron. Both were worthy in the sight of God and scrupulously observed all the commandments and observances of the Lord. But 
They were childless. Elizabeth was barren, and they were both getting on in years. Now it was the turn of Zachariah's section to serve, and he was exercising his priestly office before God when it fell to him by lot, as the ritual custom was, to enter the Lord's sanctuary and burn incense there. And at the hour of incense, the whole congregation was outside praying. Then there appeared to him the angel of the Lord, standing on the right of the altar of incense. The sight disturbed Zechariah, and he was overcome with fear. But the angel said to him, Zechariah, do not be afraid. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife, Elizabeth, is to bear you a son, and you must name him John. He will be your joy and delight, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He must drink no wine, no strong drink. Even from his mother's womb, he will be filled with the Holy Spirit. And he will bring back many of the sons of Israel to the Lord their God. With the spirit and power of Elijah, who will go before him to turn the hearts of fathers toward their children and the disobedient back to the wisdom that the virtuous have, preparing for the Lord a people fit him. Zechariah said to the angel, how can I be sure of this? I'm an old man. My wife is getting on in years. The angel replied, I am Gabriel, who stand in God's presence, and I have been sent to you, and I bring you this good news. Listen, since you have not believed my words, which will come true at their appointed time, you will be silenced and have no power of speech until this has happened. <clears throat> Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah and were surprised that he stayed in the sanctuary so long. When he came out, he could not speak to them. And they realized that he had received a vision in the sanctuary, but he could only make signs to them and he remained dumb. Now verse 62 said, it leads us to believe that he was also deaf. When his time of service came to an end, he returned home. Sometime later, his wife Elizabeth conceived, and for five months she kept to herself. The Lord has done this for me, she said. Now that it has pleased him to take away the humiliation I suffered among men. Mm -hmm. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise you, Lord Jesus Christ. Christ. Isn't that quite an amazing experience for Zechariah? We can't even imagine what it's like. Can you imagine the fright that he must have had? What? is going on here, an angel, and it actually describes the angels on the right side of the incense altar. No matter how righteous a person is, I can't imagine that a person can look at an angel without feeling startled and afraid. Um, St. John Chrysostom from the Navarre uh, commentary says, Zachariah just couldn't take the brightness that surrounded him without shaking. Not so much, he said, because of the angel's superiority, but because of the grandeur of God's majesty shining through the angel. Through the angel, God intervened, intervened in an extraordinary way and brings a message that will fulfill God's promises that will have a great significance on the whole world for time and eternity. The archangel, St. Gabriel, announces to Zechariah that his prayer has been heard. Well, God knows our prayers. God knows what's in our heart. And uh, according to St. Jerome, uh, in other words, you've been given more than you have even asked for. Isn't that the way God is? You ask him for something or you want something. And it seems even better than you could ever dream or imagine. You prayed for a son. This 
Zechariah prayed for that son and the salvation of your people. And you have been given the precursor, the one who will prepare the way. Wow. One who will make ready the way of the Lord. But poor Zechariah, he said, I want a sign. Well, uh, as one of our leaders said, the angel Gabriel was standing right there. What more sign do you want? Okay? But uh, that's what he said. I am Gabriel. You know, he's probably pretty upset. I'm Gabriel, who stands in the presence of God, and I was sent to bring you this good news. And behold, you will be silent and unable to speak until the day these things come to pass, because you did not believe my words. What are the three reasons St. Gabriel gives to Zechariah, and why should he rejoice instead of wanting a sign? First of all, God will bestow exceptional holiness on his son. His son will lead many to salvation, and everything his son does will prepare the way for the Messiah. That's a wow God, isn't it? Now, the first thing God did was move into the ordinary life of Zechariah and Elizabeth. And he brought it into an extraordinary supernatural experience. Zechariah was very excited anyway. It was a special time for him in his priestly life. It was his turn by lot, meaning I don't know if they uh, threw stones or dice or drew straws or whatever, however they did it by lot. Um, they chose, God chose that person rather than them. And so uh, it was his turn, uh, his section Abijah's turn to serve, but there were 800 priests. And so they had to, from, it was the 24th, 24 sections, 800 priests, and Abijah was the section that was chosen to do that, that uh, at that time, and to tend the brazier on the altar of incense. And this was in the most holy place, which is in the front of the veil that, it, that protects the holy of holies. Mm -hmm. In the courtyard, there, there was a courtyard, um, and if you could picture this tent of meeting in the desert, and then they, and then they made uh, a temple like it, Solomon's temple, but that was burned down and destroyed. And at this point, there was no Ark of the Covenant, but at the first, uh, temple in the desert, the Ark of the Covenant was placed in the Holy of Holies. And that was where the Ark of the Covenant was. It was beaten gold on the inside. It was purified. And uh, that was the Ark of the Old Covenant. It held the uh, Ten Commandments. It held Aaron's uh, branch that had blossomed and some of the manna that they received in the desert. And so that was kept in the holiest place. God had told them exactly how they were to build this, uh, this temple. And so a veil hung between that and what was known as the next room was the holy place. So it was the holy of holies, a veil separated the people from God. Um, there's a story about, I think his name was Yusa, uh, the person who his father uh, had taken care of the ark, and when they went to transport it, um, I, I, I'm not sure if it was with Joshua or where it was being transported at this point because they carried it different places. But he, this was his father's in his father's care, and so he went to. It, it looked like to him the ark was going to fall off of the poles, so he went to grab it to protect it, but he died. He was killed instantly because he was not. Prepared. He was not an ordained priest, and only the high priest on one day of the year, the high priest on one day of the year, the Day of Atonement, was allowed to go back into the Holy of Holies. And actually, they began to tie a rope around the high priest because if the offering was not pure, uh, and they didn't hear the bells ringing, and it was silent behind the uh, veil, uh, they would the guy out oh. as in dead okay. so, <laughs> because the offering had to be pure and so the high priest uh, that's why Jesus he is the high priest and he died once for all of us his offering was a perfect sacrifice but so a uh, picture this the room 
the Holy of Holies. The next room was the Holy Place, and that is where the showbread was, the lampstands, the um, the um, brazier for the altar of incense. The altar of incense had to be offered in the morning. The incense meant the prayers were going up to the people, and the majority of the people, the majority of the priests were uh, outside praying in the courtyard. So there was the Holy of Holies, the Holy Place, uh, and then outside was the courtyard where people stayed and prayed while the incense was being offered up to the Lord. It was as if their prayers were being offered up to the Lord. And so they prayed, and that was why the angel said to him, your prayer has been heard. You're going to have a son. He was praying for his son. How long? We don't know. Um, but the, he was tending the fire in the evening uh, when the majority of the people were there in front of the Holy of Holies. So behind, not in the Holy of Holies, but in front of. And that's where the angel appeared to her. So during this hour, when the incense was burning, the community was praying outside in the court of the Israelites, is what it was called, because then they had a court of, of the Gentiles as well. They weren't allowed even in the temple area, but they were outside, those who believed in God. So the incense symbolized the prayers of the people going up to God. Now, when Zechariah was performing this priestly duty, God sent this angel to him. This angel was no ordinary angel. This angel's name was Gabriel. And we know that Gabriel was an archangel who stands in front of the Lord in the presence of God. And the angel Gabriel said, I have been sent to you to bring you good news. Now, the uh, angel Gabriel had appeared to Daniel. He had appeared to different people in the Old Testament. So when he said his name, I'm sure that, uh, that Zechariah knew who he was. And this angel, he even describes where he was standing. The good news that Gabriel proclaimed was that Zechariah's wife, Elizabeth, was to have a son. It surprised him so much. And he said, well, how can I be sure? Well, the angel Gabriel didn't like that. We read that. And we know that God's promises and plans, though, will be fulfilled, even if we get in the way at times. He's aware of every promise he's made, and he will be true to them. The prophets prepared all of Israel for such a time as this. Galatians 4.4 says, When the fullness of time came, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, in order that he might redeem those under the law, and that we might receive adoptions as sons. God had a particular plan for John the Baptist. He was the one that was chosen to prepare the way for the Messiah in the spirit and power of Elijah, according to the word in John 1, 6. He was a man sent by God. He did this by calling the people to repentance, to call them to turn away from their sins and turn their hearts back to God. Now, John the Baptist challenged God's people and anyone who would listen to reform their lives, to repent, be baptized as a sign of their repentance as a sign of repentance, a sign that they were sorry for their sins, that they were willing to turn away from sin and be prepared for the Messiah. So remember the Holy Spirit dwelled in John the Baptist even when he was in his mother's uh, Elizabeth's womb. So it was the Holy Spirit who was the power in John, Catechism 523. Jesus. And John was more than a prophet. In him, the Holy Spirit concludes his speaking through all of the prophets. Uh, he completes the cycle of prophets begun by Elijah. So John's baptism was for repentance. The baptism of Jesus, he said, there's one coming after me, and he will baptize you with water and the Holy Spirit and fire. And at that time, when Jesus baptizes us, it will be, uh, it will be for a new birth, but it will be for the forgiveness of sins. So Jesus was telling us we must be born again of water and the Spirit. Well, Gabriel means the might of God, and certainly Zechariah received his sign. And uh, Elizabeth kept to herself because most likely of the strangeness of her pregnancy. At such an elderly age, she probably was just praising God within her being, and quite possibly she stayed uh, to herself because of holy modesty. Uh, perhaps God wanted her not to make known what he was doing until that appointed time when she said, uh, blessed is the one who believes in the promise. So when she reads uh, the blessed mother. So I, I think that uh, there's so much uh, that we want to do for God. 
We want to say yes to him in every way that we can. And we want to simply trust in faith what he has done for us. And we need to know that we're here for a purpose, each one of us. God has a plan and a purpose for each of us. And so let us take hold of that uh, today to say, uh, not doubt in any way. Maybe I should be here, maybe I should. Maybe I should study God's word, maybe I should. I don't know. What am I supposed to do, Lord? Well, he called you here through somebody or through a notice or whatever. And he called you here because he wants you here for his purpose. So I, I'm really glad that you are here studying the word of God. And I look forward to getting into our next week's lesson when we talk about the birth of John the Baptist and, and the plans of God for us. So, Lord, I thank you for this word today. I ask that you use it to direct our lives, Lord, um, that we wouldn't have any doubts, Lord, that we would just place our trust in you. And we pray in your holy and precious name, Jesus, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.